My name is Sonia Lokar and I come from Slovenia, which used to be a republic in the former socialist Yugoslavia. As you know, this country was destroyed in a war in the in middle, middle of the 90s. Um, I was born in a very normal, mediocre family. My father was an officer of the partisan army. My mother was a, a clerk in the bank. I finished my uh, education in socialist times. Uh, I finished the university at the beginning of the 70s. Got married, got two children. But all my life, when I was really little, little girl, I was interested uh, in social issues, in social justice. I don't know why is it so. I, I just felt that the world is not just and the things has to change. And for me it was normal and, and self-understandable to become a member of the Communist Party of those times. Because Communist Party really had a great social program, very interesting ideas, a, a lot of answers to, to difficult questions, not only for my country, but the whole world. It was not a, a small-minded uh, party. It was really a party with a big brain. And this is what really attracted me. And then I became a member. But then I learned very, not very quickly, but step by step, that it is one thing what party says in its program, and it's another thing what its cadres do in practical life. So this is how I, I started really, uh, my first battles in politics were for the change of my party, so that the party will not speak one thing and do another. And so I little by little became quite uh, known in the so uh, Communist Party of Slovenia. And before the change of the system, I was elected uh, um, uh, how to um, executive secretary <coughs> for the party reform and my whole work in the end of the 80s was how to reform my party to become internally democratic how to be really a, a, a think tank of the, the social progress this is what i thought that the communist party should be not the governance but the think tank of the social progress, but then the, the government should be democratically elected. And it doesn't matter if these are only communists there. I, I, it was not my idea of democracy. And I, I succeeded quite well in my own uh, communist party in Slovenia. We really made the change, but then the whole country, first uh, communists of Yugoslavia fell apart, and then the whole country fell apart, and then the war started. And before the war, we had first free elections. And in these elections, my, my party came first, but it meant only 17%. And in democracy, where you have many parties, you need a coalition to make a government. And we couldn't make a coalition. Nobody wanted to be a partner of the former leaders of the country. So uh, it was a, a, a right-wing coalition which started to uh, lead the process of, of political change in, in Slovenia. Um, I, st I was elected uh, twice in the parliament of my country, first in socialist parliament and then in the first parliament which was freely elected with multi-party system. Uh, and in this moment I realized that all the parties which came into being uh, in this process of democratization of the country forgot about gender equality. They just didn't do anything about it anymore. Even my own party forgot about it. And the women disappeared from politics. In socialist times, we had 30% of women nearly in positions of power, in uh, legislative, much less in executive. And we had a lot of women in the, uh, on the level of uh, uh, workers' councils which were leading the factories and uh, in the local communities, in their uh, assemblies of local communities, all of a sudden, all of them disappeared. Can you imagine that you had nearly 30% and then you are down to 11%? It was just a shock. And then I looked around and I saw, oh, in my party group I'm the only woman who is in the parliament. What happened to this party? Where are the women? So, I, uh, as, as before, I led the process of democratization of the party. And one part of this process was to um, let 
party members to form fractions within the party. So I formed a fraction of women. Because before it was unthinkable to have formed fractions in the party. The, the fear of this unit in the party was so big that if you start to think about the fractions, they would kick you out of the party. But at the end of the 80s, we understood if we have one party system and there is no democracy in it, this is not democracy. This is terrible. This is dictature. So the, the, the statute of the party enabled the reform statute to have fractions. And then I said, OK, now I will make a women's fraction. And I, I made a women's fraction in my party. And then I led this for 10 years. Uh, I was not re-elected in the parliament. It was uh, because I didn't understand that in this new situation, it is not like it was before. You worked, and then the party leadership would see how uh -huh, this person is talented and would push you further because they needed capable people. In this new system, everybody worked for himself, for herself. I never formed a, a group which would push me further. I didn't have anybody in Slovenia. My, my family came from, from Croatia. So I didn't have a social network in Slovenia and family ties and everything you need to, to, easy, to, 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 to be easy for you to, to succeed in politics. I just had myself. And it was not enough, of course. So I was not uh, re-elected. But then uh, I started to, to work much more um, on the international level. It, already before the war in Yugoslavia, uh, I was trying to persuade, because I was in the position in Slovenian party t and I, other people from other Republican parties, because I did this reform, they invited me to tell them why I'm doing this reform, what is this reform about. So I traveled a lot uh, all over former Yugoslavia, talking to the left people, to the party people, but they couldn't really pick up the idea. It, it, it was not possible because we were lucky in Slovenia to have a very enlightened leadership. And in the other places, it was not like that. So people were interested, wanted to listen to it, but didn't move as fast as we did. So uh, when the war started to grow in Yugoslavia, uh, I joined civil society peace movements because women were the ones who tried to prevent the war. And I connected the women from all over Yugoslavia. They were shooting already at each other, but we were talking to each other, trying to stop, to first not to happen, when it happened, trying to stop it. We, we, we didn't succeed. So first vic victims in Sarajevo were women from our peace movement, young students of medicine, they were killed. They were the first to die. So it was really, really a huge, heartbreaking thing when you know what's going to happen. You know that you should prevent it. You are a political person. You need to do it. It's your duty. I couldn't do it. And th the other women who thought like me also couldn't do it. So it was too big for us. Um, but in, uh, so for, for some years we were just doing peace movement and I, I, I fought for women's rights in Slovenia, like I told in the conference, together with many other women, very interesting, different women. But when the war stopped in Bosnia in 1995, um, uh, then I was already connected to the network which is called C Network for Gender Issues. And this is a network of social democratic women from the countries uh, of former socialism who started to work together in 1994. So we were working together. And our first idea was how to make our parties much more gender sensitive than they were uh, at this moment. Uh, and uh, if you look now in the history, you will see that all these parties established their first women's organizations exactly in the 90s, in the mid-90s. I had my, my example from Slovenia, and then they accepted it to do it everywhere. And when we started to do this in left-wing parties, then the other parties had to do the same, because it's a competition and they couldn't ignore us. And little by little, um, we, we got connected in the region. And then it was the war in, in uh, NATO bombing of Serbia, peace agreement around Kosovo, uh, Milosevic was ousted, and then the European Union and other 
United States of America and other progressive countries, China, I don't know, was not there in this time. No, I'm, I don't remember. No, it was not. It, Japan was, but China was not there. Established something which was called uh, Stability Pact for Southeastern Europe. It was a sort of a Marshall Plan, how to make these countries normal again. And there was nothing about women there in this idea of this Marshall Plan. But uh, my network was strong enough and connected enough that we made a protest against a plan to do the recovery of the region without women. And we said, okay, we want to be a part of this story. And we proposed to establish a, a, a special gender equality mechanism within this big plan. And it was called Gender Task Force. And it was really funny because when they came for the first time in Sarajevo and all these big men met there, knock, knock, women on the door. And we were lucky there was a, a, a leader of um, uh, um, an ambassador from USA uh, who was uh, responsible for the OSCE in, in Bosnia. And uh, when he saw that there is nothing about women, he informed us. So we started uh, the initiative practically on, on, on his information that there is nothing about women. And then we, uh, he helped us when we made the petition and gathered the signatures in one week in the middle of the summer. It was more than 150 signatures from very uh, visible, important women actors uh, from politics, civil society experts from all over the Balkan region. So we had something in our hands, this petition, and we knocked on the door and, and, and this ambassador opened the door for us. So they said, oh, blah, what, what an, an interesting thing. We, yes, we will accept your idea, da, da, da. And they went home, holidays in between, and then in October, they started to establish organizational uh, task forces, and there was no gender task force. So again, we did the whole thing, and then they said, okay, okay, if it had to be, let's do it. And they, they accept. But then it was really an incredible thing because we sit together, all these women who signed the petition, and we made a plan. What we want to change in order to get our region back to normal. And our plan was very short and very narrow. It was, we want three things. First thing, we want to have much more women in decision-making positions. We cannot have 3% of women in the parliaments. It's not acceptable. We want to have gender equality mechanisms in order to make our countries a, a new legal framework for gender equality in democratic uh, environment. And uh, we want, this was the third thing, we want the media to change their attitude towards uh, gender equality because media were absolutely on the conservative side. You know, the, 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 they described women either as victims, either as raw meat. Nothing in between. A woman who is active, an agent of change, she didn't exist. For, and it, it was really, really a bad situation. Uh, and what happened because this, um, this was states were forming this stability pact. States were giving money for the work of the gender task force. And for the first time, we got enough money to organize massive, massive training of women in order to become politically active. Thousands of women. In, in the Balkans, I think we have trained more than 30,000 women. These were small seminars, you know, for 25 people, but it was the same program, uh, the same basic things. What is gender equality? Why women should be there? how we can do it. And this was the most important, how we can do it. It, it, it. it was about how to get inside our own parties, how to prepare our parties to uh, accept legal changes. Uh, it was about how we can establish gender equality mechanisms, what should be there, how to write a law on gender equality, how to um, uh, organize a, a, a body within the parliament which will deal with gender equality, how to make governmental body for gender equality, all of this. We, we, we talked about that and about issues we want to change. And this is how uh, the Balkans changed, in the, but it took us 10 years. So we started in 1999 
And when the gender, it, it was the moment when the gender task force was formed and I was uh, a leader. And it, it ended in 2009. When we started, the percentage of women average in our parliaments were 7%, was 7%. Now it's over 27. Now, but in 2009 it was about 24. So it was a huge, huge progress. And at the same time, things changed. But this is really, today when I think about this and, and, and how we did it and why we were successful, it, it costed very little. It didn't really put the finger into the most important things, which was we were not able to, to reverse, to change the, the pattern of development which was pushed on these countries. We couldn't say, no, you will not destroy our industrial potential. We couldn't say, no, you will not buy our industrial jewels for nothing. We couldn't say, no, we will not let you uh, um, bring in the most dirty industries. We were not strong enough to do that. So, in fact, today when I think about it, it feels sometimes like, okay, this is an orchestra. It, 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 it plays wonderful music. But this is on the Titanic, and Titanic is sinking. So it's so many things we could not do because we were not strong enough, not well organized enough, maybe not even the right persons, because you need expertise and economic knowledge, social knowledge, many things to, to reverse the trend, the, the economic pattern. I think this is something which waits for us. We, we made the first step, we brought the quantity of the women in political decision-making process. But now it's another battle which is much more difficult. You have remained a communist in heart and in action. Oh, this is a very difficult question, you know, because when I think about communism, um, when I think about uh, theoretical um, basis of communism, I think it's valid, absolutely valid. If I think about the values communists have, they are absolutely valid. But when I think about how things were done in the history and how many mistakes, even, even, even crimes, communists did in, in the best of, of intentions, I don't, then I'm not a communist. I don't, I don't think that you can and you should push anybody with a stick in the, uh, in, in the heaven. No, people have to democratically understand and, and go for it, for their own free will. And it will take us much longer time, but then the, the backlashes will not be as strong as they are now. Because I think that the main, uh, uh, when I think about Yugoslavia, Communists were a, a minority of the population. This was an enlightened minority, which uh, wanted all the best for the nation. They were not greedy, they were not uh, corrupt, they didn't do, they did, did many mistakes, very bad mistakes also. But at the end of the day, they wanted to think instead of the people. I don't want that. I don't want to think instead of the people. I, I think that the modern, uh, modern left has to be a collective intellectual, a collective leader of the process. And for this you absolutely need democratic uh, 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 interaction between the people. And in, in, in the times when my co uh, older colleagues, communists, were uh, in place and were governing the country, we didn't have the means we have now. Today it's easy to check the, the thinking of the people. You have internet, you can vote on everything. You can have a referendum in the party on any important decision and you can have a, a public debate on it even not seeing each other because technical means are there. But we don't use this. My party is still working like we are in the Middle Ages and there is nothing but newspaper you can read. This is very wrong. And this is why we are not in a good skin and why my party is not uh, the most important party in the society. But it's one of the smallest ones and very confused and doesn't know what really should, should be doing. So I think we have a lot to do. Thank you.